Hello, and welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts. The topic of this video is crystal-induced arthritis. But to be honest, I'm mostly going to focus on gout, which has a very interesting pathophysiology, and which is fairly common, affecting about 4% uh, of American adults, about 9 million people. Now, gout and pseudogout are some of the crystal-induced arthritides, which can be due to either endogenous crystals or exogenous materials. Endogenous crystals include monosodium urate in gout, calcium pyrophosphate in pseudogout, and basic calcium phosphate. Just as a reminder, the terms urate and uric acid are synonymous. We can also get crystal-induced arthritis due to exogenous materials such as biomaterials from prosthetic joints. And in all of these cases, these trigger inflammatory reactions that destroy cartilage. So let's begin first with gout. So gout is caused by the deposition of monosodium urate crystals in and around joints that initially presents as a transient acute arthritis. Now we know that hyperuricemia is necessary but not sufficient for the development of gout. Now the way that we get hyperuricemia can either be through increased production or decreased excretion. Now please remember that uric acid is the end product of purine catabolism, and we tend to see increased production when we have some defect in the uh, formation of purine, so in purine anabolism. Now as you recall, purines are formed by two different pathways. There's the de novo pathway, which is formed from non-purine precursors, and the salvage pathway, in which free purines from the diet or from DNA and RNA degradation are transformed into purines that can be used by the body. Important uh, enzyme used in this is hypoxanthine guanine phosphoribozole transferase, or HGPRT, which will show up a little bit later in this video. You may also read that uh, you can get hyperuricemia due to tumor lysis syndrome. Please don't think of this as being a common cause of gout. Tumor lysis syndrome occurs typically with uh, hematopoietic neoplasms when chemotherapy is given and there is abundant die-off of cells. We have the release of abundant DNA and RNA, which can lead to hyperuricemia, but we're also going to get hyperkalemia and hyperphosphatemia. The hyperphosphatemia can result in hypocalcemia, and all of these different electrolytes can result in acute renal injury. Uh, and so this is actually an oncologic emergency. So it's not that someone is going to present with isolated gout in the context of tumor lysis syndrome. We can also see hyperuricemia due to decreased excretion. Uh, we don't know the mechanism for this, but it, this is the most common cause in primary gout. We can also see decreased excretion in chronic renal failure. So let's take a look here to see how we actually get to uric acid and what happens to it. So this is very abbreviated, the uh, pathway from nucleic acids to purines, uh, and then we get to hypoxanthine, and it becomes a little bit more straightforward after this. So with hypoxanthine, we use the uh, enzyme xanthine oxidase, which is going to transform this to xanthine. Xanthine oxidase then acts again to transform this to uric acid, which can then be excreted from the kidneys. Now, a couple of points to make are that hypoxanthine and xanthine are both more soluble in water than uric acid, and this will become important when we talk about therapeutics. I also want to mention that the uh, hypoxanthine back to purines uh, is the salvage pathway, and that is where our enzyme HGPRT is going to play a role, and this will become important in a little bit. Now, there are multiple risk factors for gout. We know that uh, increases uh, in incidence with age uh, and duration of hyperuricemia. It's thought that we get gout about 20 to 30 years after uh, uh, we become hyperuricemic. But then again, when we're hyperuricemic, we're asymptomatic, so we don't really know this exact range of time. Gout is more commonly associated with males, and this is perhaps because asymptomatic uricemia tends to begin around puberty in that sex, and in contrast, occurs after menopause in females. Uh, there are some rare genetic uh, causes of uh, gout, such as X-linked HGPRT abnormalities, and we can also see an increased risk of gout with uh, excess alcohol consumption and obesity, and some medications that reduce urate excretion. So what is the pathogenesis of gout? So we have this uh, monosodium urate crystals that are deposited in and around joints, and macrophages will ingest those crystals, resulting in uh, activation of the inflammasome. Now, if you're like me, it's been a while since you thought about the inflammasome, so let's go ahead and take a look uh, at this figure. This actually comes from the 10th edition of Robin's uh, Basic Pathology. 
So as you'll recall, you have infection or cell injury, uh, which is going to cause the formation of this cytosolic multi-protein enzymatic complex called the inflammasome. And the role of the inflammasome is to generate uh, the proteolytically active caspase 1. Now what caspase 1 will do is that it's going to take pro-IL-1 beta, cleave it, and activate it. Pro-IL-1 beta gene activation will come following signals from toll-like receptors and other receptors. Now the cleaved IL-1 beta can be secreted and it is a very uh, potent mediator of acute inflammation due to its ability to recruit and activate uh, neutrophils. So let's return back to our story. We have our activation of the inflammasome, our generation of IL-1 beta, recruitment activation of neutrophils, and then we're going to get the release of abundant mediators, so cytokines, proteases, free radicals. Now another uh, point here is that our neutrophils, as well as our macrophages, are phagocytes, so they will ingest crystals. Now because the crystals in gout are sharp and needle-like, they can actually pierce the membrane of the phagolysosome, resulting in the leakage of lysosomal enzymes. Let's put all this together in a figure from Robbins and Kumar Basic Pathology. So here we have our initiating step with our hyperuricemia, resulting in precipitation of urate crystals in joints. These are then going to be phagocytosed by macrophages with activation of the inflammasome and release of IL-1. So IL-1 is going to cause neutrophil chemotaxis, and let's just come back here for a moment and finish our macrophage story. So our macrophages uh, have ingested these needles, which can cause lysosomal rupture and additional release of mediators, uh, resulting in the release of lysosomal enzymes. Now coming back to our neutrophils, our neutrophils are brought here to the synovium. They're also going to phagocytose these crystals, uh, and they can undergo lysis, or they can have piercing of their phagolysosome, resulting in release of crystals as well as release of lysosomal enzymes. All of this is going to lead to tissue injury and inflammation. So there are uh, several clinical stages of gout. We have, as I mentioned, this period of asymptomatic hyperuricemia, which we believe begins in puberty in men and menopause in women. At some point, after a certain period of hyperuricemia, the patient is going to have the sudden onset of absolutely excruciating joint pain with localized hyperemia and warmth, and about half of these cases will occur in the first metatarsophalangeal joint, or the big toe. This is absolutely classic. Now, even without therapy, uh, this will resolve in a few weeks, and the patient will uh, enter an asymptomatic intercritical period. This is the symptom-free interval between attacks. Now, without treatment, these attacks will become more frequent and will affect more and more joints. Now, after about 10 years uh, from the initial attack, we're going to get the development of chronic tophaceous gout, in which we get this chalk-like deposition of urate uh, around the, the joint and in the soft tissue, resulting in juxtaarticular bone erosion and loss of joint space. So what will we see morphologically? In acute gouty arthritis, we're going to see an edematous synovium with intense inflammatory infiltrate, and everybody is coming to the party. We have neutrophils, lymphocytes, plasma cells, macrophages, and we can also identify needle-shaped crystals in the synovium. Chronic tophaceous arthritis is characterized by crystals that absolutely encrust the articular surface and these chalky deposits in this hyperplastic fibrotic synovium uh, with cartilage destruction. So let's look first at what we see in acute gouty arthritis and with our microscopy. Here you can see an aspirate of a joint with gout. These are neutrophils, which you can recognize by their nuclei, and you can see the reverse staining here where these needle-like crystals are here within the cytoplasm. Here's another one right here. Uh, you can appreciate the needle-like appearance in this uh, polarized image. Uh, here are those needle-like crystals. And then in chronic tophaceous gout, we're going to get these large chalky deposits. And you can see here we have a multinucleate form body giant cell uh, trying desperately to uh, eat this up. We also have a lot of fibrosis and associated inflammation. Now, grossly, what we're going to see are going to be these deposits of this chalky material. You can see it here uh, beneath the joint here, invading the joint within this joint here. And there's even a little bit of this chalky deposit here and here.
So how do we treat gout? So the first step will be lifestyle modification uh, with weight loss and decreased alcohol and sugar consumption. You also want to decrease uh, the ingestion of purine-rich foods, such as organ meat, such as liver and seafood, and exercise is good. But there are also some very interesting medications that you can use uh, to treat this. And this is why I went through the process of talking about how uric acid is formed. So these are the pharmacologic agents. We have something called a uricosouric drug. What this means is getting uric acid into the urine. And the way this functions is by decreasing uric acid reabsorption in the proximal tubules of the kidney. Since we are decreasing reabsorption, we are increasing our excretion. We can also use uh, inhibitors of xanthine oxidase, such as allopurinol, which will block the catabolism of xanthine and hypoxanthine to uric acid. Remember, xanthine and hypoxanthine are more soluble in water and will not deposit in the joint. Uh, urate oxidases are particularly interesting. These are not found in humans, but we can uh, create a recombinant protein. And what this will do is it will catalyze the oxidation of uric acid to allantoin, which can be freely excreted by the kidneys. I will leave the discussion of the mechanism of colchicine to your pharmacology instructor and simply mention that it inhibits recruitment and activity of neutrophils. Uh, NSAIDs can be used as anti-inflammatories, but don't use aspirin because aspirin actually inhibits renal excretion of uric acid and increases uh, plasma uric acid. Uh, this is the website from which I got this information because I am not a, a pharmacologist. You may find this helpful as well. So let's put this all together, going back to what we discussed earlier. We have our nucleic acids to our purines to our hypoxanthine. Using our allopurinol, we're going to block xanthine oxidase, causing a buildup of hypoxanthine and or xanthine, which can be uh, more easily excreted because they uh, don't deposit in the joints. Uh, we can also use our uric drugs to result in renal excretion and urate, urate oxidase, which will take uric acid to allantoin, which is water soluble. So this brings us uh, to the uh, second disease I want to consider, which is calcium pyrophosphate crystal deposition or pseudogout, which is even more common than gout. We see this uh, in patients over the age of 50. In fact, about 60% of people over 85 have pseudogout. There are three different types. We have sporadic or idiopathic pseudogout. We have rare uh, instances of hereditary pseudogout due to autosomal dominant gain of function mutations in an inorganic pyrophosphate transporter. And then we can get secondary pseudogout due to joint injury or iron deposition and hemochromatosis, hyperparathyroidism, diabetes, or hypothyroidism. Now, we don't know the exact pathogenesis of pseudogout. What's thought is that with age, we get degradation of our articular cartilage proteoglycans. These uh, proteoglycans normally inhibit calcification, but as they are degraded, we get crystallization around chondrocytes. This is going to cause inflammation, resulting again in the activation of our inflammasome. So what do we see morphologically? We're going to get crystals in our articular cartilage, menisci, and intervertebral discs, and these can rupture into the joint space. Here you can see a histologic section with this uh, amorphous purplish material. This is how calcium stains in histologic sections stained with H and E. They're chalky white and friable deposits, and we have a mild inflammatory response than gout, perhaps because the crystals are rhomboid, they're not needle-shaped, so they don't cause as much injury uh, to our phagolysosomes. Uh, the uh, clinical features of pseudogout is that it can be completely asymptomatic and diagnosed uh, purely uh, based on um, finding it incidentally, for example, in uh, our joint arthroplasty, or it can be acute, subacute, or chronic arthritis that affects one or multiple joints. Most commonly affects the knees, but can also arise in the wrist, elbows, shoulders, and ankles. We treat this with oral anti-inflammatory medications, and with monoarticular pseudogout, can use intraarticular corticosteroids. You can also use low-dose uh, colchicine. As always, here are some uh, questions to help you uh, review what you have learned in this short video. As always, thank you very much for your time and attention.